All right, well, I really appreciate you guys inviting me here today. What I wanted to talk to you about is really how we can rebuild the power grid or not so much rebuild the power grid, but there are a whole lot of opportunities right now as the power grid is changing, as we have discovered a lot of new natural gas, we've discovered um, things that are pushing down on the, pre uh, on the uh, price pressure of the grid. So it's putting nuclear out of business, it's putting coal out of business. And as we rebuild things, let's do it better than what we have before, what, th than what we've had previously. So a little vocabulary and a little introduction to power. There's a lot of qualities that are worth thinking about with electricity. Uh, electricity, we'll call it high grade energy, uh, as opposed to say firewood or something like that. Um, it's clean, high density. It doesn't make noise. It doesn't take up a lot of space as you transport it. We've been at it for years and years. We've been making electricity for 150 more or more years. And there's lots and lots of things anywhere down to your watch or your phone that use electricity all the way up to big power plants, huge motors, things like that. We have a big and a well-developed infrastructure throughout the whole country. So we're good at pushing electricity out and moving it around places. Um, it's a lot easier to handle than say hot water or steam or even cold water. Um, and it's more efficient and cost effective to move across hundreds or even thousands of miles. I can move electricity very easily compared to say natural gas. Um, so the power grid can take energy from lots and lots. You can even think of it as a marketplace. You can think of it as a place where we buy and sell energy and it happens to be in the form of electricity, but we can convert it from that form to lots of other forms. A couple of vocabulary words for you. Um, when something's available, it's ready when you want it. So the car sitting in the driveway, you think that's available. Last time you used it, it worked fine. You have a reasonable assumption that it's gonna work fine next time you use it. Capacity factor is the time, the percentage of time that something actually runs. So for instance, that car, if you drove it to work, it sat for eight or 10 hours, and then you drove it home, it's got a pretty low capacity factor, maybe a half hour, an hour a day. Your watch, or let's say your phone, you're looking at that constantly. You're always looking at that. So it's got a very high capacity factor. The amount of time you're actually using it for some, I won't say productive, but the amount of time that you're actually engaging with that object um, is really high as a percentage of your, your day. Power quality, when I, I talk about that, we're talking about things like voltage and frequency and even the sine wave shape of the uh, alternating current. Reliable and resilient are interesting words. Let's think about a cross country runner. A cross country runner who runs through snow, runs through rain, runs over rocks and roots and small animals and through the woods, they're reliable under almost any conditions, but at some point they're gonna fall down. Everybody does. The resilient cross-country runner falls down, trips, says, oh, that's too bad, gets up and runs again, okay? The non-resilient one, of course, is gonna spend longer getting going again. So we can think of these as metaphors in the power industry. <laughs> this is what we've got mostly today. We've got central power plants owned and operated by utilities. The ownership and the operation is not nearly as important as these physical characteristics. Um, we built these really big power plants, typically on less expensive land. They're not right here in the city, they're out somewhere else. They're over there. Um, they typically are either close to the fuel or close to the water because the mass of fuel or the mass of water required is very expensive to move somewhere else. So you sit the power plant right on a mine or right on a wellhead. Um, <laughs> efficiency tends to be really big and really efficient uh, because um, at scale th things can be made more efficient. We won't go into deep detail on that. The aesthetics are pretty much out of sight, out of mind. They're over there, they're not here. Um, there's less of an env obvious environmental impact simply because we're not touching them. We're not seeing them every day and they're not in our community. A good thing is there's a single point of waste that is leaving the plant. The solid waste, the liquid waste, the noise and the thermal energy is leaving. And so there is a nice opportunity to control those problems at the point source, all right? Let's think about a microgrid, and not everybody even is gonna know what a microgrid is. Um, it's gonna have these characteristics. It'll be smaller scale. At Princeton University, we have a microgrid that serves 12, 13,000 people instead of millions or tens of millions. Um, it's close to the energy users, and it's gonna be efficient through a diversity of use. 
uh, that is, I may actually be able to make steam as well as power. I may actually be able to serve multiple people at the same time or multiple buildings at the same time, such as at Hudson Yards. Um, it can take advantage of local labor and fuel supplies. If I work at the really big power plant over there, I may tra travel 100 miles to get there, and so may my coworkers. If I work at the little co-generation plant in my neighborhood, that's gonna draw from the region or even the, the, the local community. Um, there's gonna be user prioritized triage. Day after Hurricane Sandy, not everything has to run. In your house, what's critical? The sump pump, the coffee pot, the refrigerator, and the freezer. What's not critical? Well, you don't need to do the oven cleaning that day. You don't need to do the, um, the very uh, high energy plasma TV. Maybe you listen to the radio the day after uh, the storm. So you can make your own triage behind the meter. The utility can only see up to the meter. You can't, uh, they can't see beyond the meter. Their thought is binary. Is the power on, is the power off? Your thought is, do I have power for critical stuff? I could forego some of the non-critical stuff. It's gonna be more complex, right? There's gonna be more stuff if I have lots of little power plants serving smaller communities. But it's not an either or, it's an and. Um, and the aesthetics and the environmental impact is gonna be local. So I need to make this thing pretty enough and it needs to fit in the community wherever it is such that people are gonna say, yeah, that's okay. So the one on Princeton campus actually has a stone wall facing the campus. Um, in your neighborhood, it might look more residential scale, that kind of thing. The environmental impact is now going to be spread out. It's going to be at all these little places where you have little tiny power plants, not at one central big utility power plant. So here's a simple concept, right? I've got an electric generating station far away. I've got transmission lines. I've got some little distribution lines. I have a utility meter where they're supplying electricity and I can synchronize with the grid or I can separate. And I've got my own local generator behind the meter. That is, I can make electricity and I can connect to the grid. I can sell services, power, things like that into the grid, or I can buy power. The blue house, the sad one, does not have a microgrid, but they have the benefit of living near somebody with a microgrid. Here's turning the grid on its head. And this is the thing I wanted to try to pose to you getting you two, three layers, layers into the conversation about utilities in the country right now, or even utilities in the world right now. Let's say we have a power grid that has 12 customers. Each customer needs 50 megawatts, five zero megawatts. So 12 times 50, 600 megawatt total demand. And we wanna make reliable power. We know that everything breaks. At some point, anything we build as humans is gonna fail. So we're gonna build a power plant and 100 miles away on the same grid, we're gonna put another power plant. And this power plant could serve all the needs of the um, community. And that power plant could serve all the needs of the community. So we know at some point this will be out for maintenance. It could be a problem or it could just be routine maintenance, but we're gonna take this out of service. And that one will run so that everybody gets electricity. So we've got 100% redundancy and these have no more than a 50% capacity factor, right? Because one of them's gonna be not running all the time, or at least they won't be at full load all the time. This is a very simplified power grid. We all know it's more complex, but just for, to illustrate the ideas. We know that there are weak points, relative weak points. Of course, it's more complex than this, but there are places that are much weaker than others in the power grid. So for instance, if we took this out, through accident, through malicious damage, through, for whatever reason, you see that some customers wouldn't get power. Or if we took this out, some customers wouldn't get power. Or if this power uh, transmission line or this power plant failed, we'd be down to one and we'd, we'd have much less reliability and the possibility that people wouldn't get power. Let's rebuild that. There's an interesting way we could do this. I wanna suggest that now we have some people with microgrids some people with partial ability to serve their own loads, and some people choosing nothing because they don't have the same reliability issues or concerns. So let's look at a few different examples. This customer chose to build a microgrid. They have their own power plant. They can make 100 megawatts. They have three times 50 is 150 megawatts worth of demand. 
They chose not to build enough power so that they could power the furniture store, but the hospital and the fire department both get power in an emergency. So they can do partial load serving even if the whole grid fails. They open up the breaker and they just power, meet their own needs. This guy says, oh, well, I'm going to invest enough so that I can power all of my load separate from the grid or connected to the grid. So he's got the grid as a primary and his microgrid as backup, or maybe even the way uh, we do it, we flip around and we, we can power, actually we're much more like this, but we can power the university connected to the grid. We'll buy power when it, they can provide it cheaper. We'll make power when we can provide it cheaper. So we're really economically dispatched. But we still have the utility playing a very big and important role. They've got a power plant here, they've got a power plant here, but they're slightly smaller than before. They're 200 megawatts, not six. And we can go on and see other people's behind the meter choices of powering half their load or powering their entire load. But let's look at what happens when it breaks. I would challenge you, any one point, any two points on this system could fail concurrently and basically everybody would get all the power that they need. You could break it here, you could break it here, you could take out this power plant, or you could take out really any two power plants, and everybody is served. The interesting thing is, when you add this up, we've only got 800 megawatts worth of installed capacity, instead of 1,200 in our first example. So I've actually built less stuff and I have higher reliability and higher resilience, higher, uh, a better response to uh, the need. And I can now, because I'm close to the customer, I can take advantage of the thermal waste. When I have a power plant way over there, it's too expensive to supply the thermal energy to a community. But when the power plant is right in the community, we can take advantage of co-generation. Um, again, like Hudson Yards is, they're taking advantage of the thermal energy as well as the electric energy. So now by putting it in the community, having small scale with local employment, an opportunity to take care, advantage of local resources uh, and much higher reliability and resilience. So there's a much better way we can build the grid. Again, this is microgrids with the major power grid, not microgrids in opposition to. And this is just to, to reinforce the idea that efficient use, that is taking advantage of Thermal energy as the byproduct of power generation can be a total of about 75 to 80% efficient compared to 25 to 45% efficient of the major uh, of the main power company. We haven't we haven't dug into this very deeply. We could go into that in a question period, but basically the power company supplying electricity is going to be but, uh, around a third to maybe 40, 45, but definitely less than 50% efficient fuel in compared to electricity delivered. And combined heat and power or cogeneration is going to be well better than 50. And typically, 70 and Princeton University's cogeneration plan averages about 75 to 85% efficient through the span of the entire year. So we can dance circles laughing around the uh, power company that really has no thermal customer. All right, so those are the opportunities of rebuilding the grid in a better way than, uh, than perhaps we have today. And these are, these are the kind of takeaways. We can provide energy and grid services. We can provide benefit inside and outside the microgrid boundary. We can do this with a lower capex, a lower opex. We already discussed the reliability and resilience. So thank you. I really appreciate your paying attention, and uh, I'd be open to any questions you have.